All right, so first, let me put my contact information on the screen. Right? So this is my name, Michelle Ramlagan. And I'm going to give you my WhatsApp contact, right? Because I know you all won't abuse it because nobody wants to talk to their English teacher unless they have to, right? Uh, and this is my email address, right? My last name, then my first name at gmail.com, right? All right. All right, so this year... Um, Sue has invited any advanced students who are in four and films, four and five, who want to review some more of the basics to join us, right? Um, so the class is going to be a mix of low, a mix of lower form students, but it's tailored to lower form students. Um, but it will also have upper form students as well, right? So the students in forms one to three, I don't know if we have any form one, so probably forms two and three, um, the homework that is given in the class you need to do right the students in forms four and five you have a little more leeway with the tuesday session if it is helpful for you to do it you can do it but if you cannot do it because you have your form four and five workload you could let me know and you will have a little bit of leeway right but forms uh, lower forms any homework assigned in the class you are expected to complete right if at any point you have an assignment that you need help with for school that doesn't mean um something that you want me to do for you, right? But if you have a question or you want me to check over something that is not coursework before you submit it, you can send it to me and I'm happy to do that, right? Um, rules for the class, so everyone remains muted except for me, lucky you. Um, throughout the class, you can chat with me only, right? Um, if I don't get to respond to your question, just send it again, right? Um, if it's important. That. And as soon as I can, I will. Right. Um, if you need to step away from the screen, you could just let me know. You're stepping away for two minutes and you'll let me know when you come back. Right. All right. Any questions you'll have before we start? Any okay, any topics anybody wants to make sure we cover this term before we start? By now everybody should have their um list of topics for the term. Or you might know your problem areas. So, um, and I'll, I'll keep asking for the next few weeks, right? But if there's a topic that you would like us to cover, please see, right? Okay, so let's get started here. I'm going to clear away my contact information. And uh, we're going to get started on the um, first thing, which is um, a favorite thing that all students love, a poem, right, with some comprehension questions. And we're going to use it to help us revise um, some literary devices. Now, some of you have seen this poem already. It's a fairly popular poem. The poem is called Nature, right? So what I would ask you to do is to just um, note the title of the poem, which is Nature and the poet who wrote it, the name of the poet, right? You do not need to write down the poem. The poem is fairly easy to find in Google. All right, so we have neither summer nor winter, neither autumn nor spring. We have instead the days when go the golden sun shines on the lush green cane fields magnificently. Days when the rain beats like bullets on the roofs and there is no sound but the swish of water in the gullies and trees struggling in the high Jamaica winds. Also, there are the days when leaves fade off the guango trees. Sorry, one second. All right. Um, and the repeated cane fields lie bare and follow to the sun. But best of all, there are the days when the mango and the logwood blossom. When bushes are full of the sound of bees and the scent of honey, when the tall grass shivers to the slightest breath of air, when the buttercups have paved the earth with yellow stars, and beauty comes suddenly and the rains have gone. All right, 
So um, read the poem again to yourself, first of all. I'm going to mute myself for a minute. Just read the poem again. Try and get a sense of what the poem is saying. What do you think the poem is saying? All right, so what is this poem about? Is the poem about what the title says it's about? Good, all right, yes. So the poem is about nature, right? Um. No. Right, so we could get more specific and we could say, we could talk about which nature, where is this nature? Right, nature in, okay, so some of the answers, y'all are saying nature in Jamaica, nature in tropical countries. Good, good. Um, Seasons in Jamaica, okay, all right. All right, okay, so let's look at the first question. All right, now, um, instead of writing down the question, which might be more work, what you could do is um, phrase your answer so that when you read the answer, you could figure out what the question was, right? So I'll show you an example. What type of climate is reflected in the poem? What type of climate do you all think is reflected in the poem? Is it a... I'll give you some options to choose from. Is it a temperate climate? Is it a Mediterranean climate? Is it an Arctic climate? What type of climate is it? I didn't give you the answer, but based on those words, you could probably infer an answer. What type of climate? Um, what is Mediterranean? Okay, so good question. Um, that would be around places like Greece and Italy. So warm and um with sun but um different from other warm places what what does temperate mean mild temperatures right so a temperate clim climate has mild temperatures. Okay, so everybody thought that we are, uh, you'll figure out that we're talking about Jamaica, right? So we're talking about where we are. So how would we describe the climate where we live? Hot, all right. Okay, so I think we could say a Caribbean climate is reflected or we could say a tropical climate. Right? So what I suggest to you rather than writing out um, the question is that you write the answer um, in a sentence form so you could figure out the question, right? All right, that was the first one. Okay, so this first question is just checking our literal understanding of the poem, right? All right, next question. What does line eight of the poem reveal? And we've sort of re we've sort of discussed this in conversation. So line one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is eight, nine, ten. Ten is down here. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I think this is fifteen. Maybe I misnumbered it. We'll see. Right. So what is line eight reveal of the poem? That is this line. What do we learn here that we didn't learn before?
Okay, we learned that the trees are struggling. All right, we learned that we have a strong wind wherever we are. But don't we learn where we are in this line? Where are we? Where is this poem set? In Jamaica. All right, so we learned that the poem is talking about Jamaica. We learned the setting of the poem, right? Okay, so line eight reveals the setting. And we could get fancy and we could say of the poem, which is Jamaica, right? Right now, we want to be careful how we phrase our answer, right? If I just write an answer, the, poem, the line eight reveals that the trees are struggling. That makes it sound like what? There's a drought. The trees um, are fighting to live. But really, it's that there's a wind that Jamaica is windy. Or he wants us to think that, right? All right, so please make sure that you are taking down answers, right? Also, in a little while, I'm going to turn off the feature that will allow you to change your name. So please make sure you have your first and last name. All right, let's look at the third question. Identify two lines in the poem that contain an example of contrast. All right, so I want you all to try this first. So it's two lines. They come one after the other. And when you read one line, you read the other line, you realize there is a contrast. Anybody confused by the term contrast? What is contrast in a poem or a piece of writing? What is contrast? Okay, I'm making a note when we get to the next slide where we list, di discuss some of these devices. We'll talk about it here. But contrast is where we see difference, right? Um, it's a very basic example, but if I say the sun was shining and rain was falling, perhaps that's two contrasting states of the weather. Or if I'm talking about two brothers and I say one brother was very quiet and always kept to himself while the other brother spoke to everyone he met. Right? That would be another example of contrast. Because they're two different um, ideas. So, okay. So, let me help you focus a little bit. Let me help you look for... I'll give you some lines to examine, right? So, let's look at... These two, the first two, is there contrast between this line one and line two? Um, is he highlighting the difference? Or is he pointing out a similarity for the first in the first two lines? Okay, what else? Um what about these two? What about um, these two? And these two, right? So I've given you four choices to choose from. Which pair of lines has um, a contrast in it? Now, I disagree that it's the first two, and I'll show you why. Because he's highlighting, yes, summer and winter are different from autumn and spring. But the point of the first two lines is to say that they have, they don't have summer or winter, and they don't have autumn and spring. Right? So he's really pointing out we don't have any of these things. So that is a similarity. So we'll take off this first option, right? Everybody understands why we're ruling that out? Because even though the seasons are different, the point of mentioning them is 
um, the same to show that none of them are present in Jamaica. Okay, what about the next one? The days when the rain beats like bullets on the roofs and there is no sound but the swish of water in the gully gullies. What about this one? Is this a loud sound? Rain beats like bullets on the roofs. Is that loud? Right? And is this a soft sound? No sound but the swish? Right? So this is our answer. Right? All right. So also there are days when leaves fade and the reaped cane feels like bear and fallow. So both of these are images of nature kind of mellow and faded, not growing, right? When the buttercups have paved the earth with yellow stars and beauty comes suddenly and the rains have gone. Well, both of that, both of those are pretty pictures, right? The buttercups are pretty and then beauty comes suddenly and the rains have gone. That's a nice picture too. So our example of contrast is lines one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? Right, so lines six and seven. Um, I'll leave it as that for now. On the next page, I'll probably give you this as an example of contrast, right? All right, let's look at the next question. What literary devices swish in line seven? What literary devices swish? One business has it so far. And if you're afraid of spell, how to spell it, don't worry, just spell it. Okay, two people, yes. What is it telling us about the water? Right, good. Okay, good, good, good. It's telling us the sound of the water. So it's onomatopoeia. Right, it's telling us the water has no sound but the switch. So if we can identify it's telling us the sound, then we could get that it's given us onomatopoeia, right? So All right, find three examples of personification in the poem. So I'm going to give you a half a minute, see what you could come up with. Three examples of personification in the poem. So what is personification? When we give human characteristics to inanimate objects, right? All right, so we're looking for personification. Three examples. As soon as you find it, you can type it in the chat. Um, Josiah said, when he tore grass shivers, yes. Dana says, line 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, when the buttercups have paved the earth. Wait, I'm not sure which. Which is 16? Is that tall grass shivers as well? All right. Um... The slightest breath of air, okay, yes. All right, so let's go through it together and let's see if we find any others. All right, so we have neither summer nor winter, neither autumn nor spring. Actually, um, no, all right, we'll leave that. I was thinking with the capital letters, it's it's kind of like a proper name, but let's I'll, I'll let's no no we'll find clearer examples. All right, uh, we haven't said the days when the golden sun shines and the lush green cane fields magnificently. The days when the rain beats like bullets on the roofs. Um, I you know I I can't say this one is a personification, right? It's what people do so 
if we said the rain fired upon the roofs like bullet um like bullets then or the rain um dropped bullets onto the roof then then maybe but no now it's just a comparison now it's just a simile right all right no somebody switch up was in the gullies tree struggling so we said tree struggling in the high jamaica winds Days when leaves fade off of the the guango trees and they reap cane fields like bear and fall in the sun. There are days when the mango and dogwood blossom. Bushes are full of the sound of bees and the scent of honey. When the tall grass shivers, right? And the slightest breath of air. So here it's implying that the air is breathing, right? Um, okay, I think these are the three examples, yeah. Okay, um... What would you say, or would you say the mood of the poem is melancholic? Why or why not? What is melancholic? What's melancholy? Yes, very sad. So uh, sometimes when we're doing poems and the, po the tone of the poem is sad, like you read it and the speaker wants you to think of something sad. Um, people like to tell me that the poem is depressed because like sad is not a strong enough word. They want to convey that it's very, very sad. So they like to say depressed, right? But I want to suggest to you that instead of saying depressed, you can say melancholic, right? Um, the noun is melancholy, very sad. So would you say this is a very sad poem? Why or why not? Do you think the person in the poem feels sad? Good. No, they don't. Right. Now let's look for some phrases that tell us they're not feeling sad. So nope. Nope. Right? What are some phrases that um what some sorry, what are some phrases that tell us that they are okay, relax is a good word, yeah. All right, so when they say we have instead. The poem is celebrating it. So we don't have the four seasons, but we have all these other great things. We have golden sun. We have lush green grass. It's magnificent, right? Um, We have rain. We have the swish of water in gullies. We have high wind, right? Um, And then we have these things where nature is just sort of like resting a bit. And then there's when the flower, the trees are in bloom. Or any mango trees, any logo trees. Um, we have bees, and we have the scent of honey, um, and we have buttercups, and we have beauty, right? So all of these things are positive details that tell us this person is happy about the place. All right, how would you describe the attitude of the speaker in the poem to his country? Okay, all right, so this is related to what we just did. What is this person's attitude? Are they ashamed of their country? They're grateful, right. They are proud, yes. That's a really good word for it. Um, right. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Um, and the evidence we could give is when they say words like when they say words like magnificent and 
um, beauty and things that we have, right? All right. What sense is our appeal to in line 12? Now, let's agree on where we think line 12 is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Right. So when bushes, when bushes are full of the sound of bees and the scent of honey. So this is line 12 here. What sense is our appeal to here? Right, so when they say sound of bees, it's hearing or sound. And when they say sense of honey, it is smell. Good, good, right. All right, good. Um, the poem contains, I think it's just number nine and one more question. Uh, all of the following except so does it have imagery does it have a rhyming scheme does it have symbolism does it have figurative language one of them it doesn't have which one is it and then the last question what would you say is the theme of the poem so nine and ten try on your own and you could put your hands in the chat i'm going to give you a minute to try it right Okay, so for number nine, we agreed that the rhyming scheme is what is missing, right? And if we look at the ends of the words, so winter, spring, days, magnificently, um, we realize none of them sound the same. Roofs, gullies, winds, trees. Now, the poem could still have rhythm, I mean, some sort of beat, but it doesn't have a rhyming scheme. The, ends, the words don't sound alike, right? Symbolism. Um, if you what could be a symbol in here, boy? The cane feels maybe because it gets repeated. Um, the buttercups, the buttercups are a symbol of beauty, right? They represent beauty. Um, what could be figurative language? Well, all the things we talked about, the um, personification, the onomatopoeia, the all, all of that is figurative language. And if you think about imagery, everywhere you read something and you could see a picture or hear a sound or smell something. That is imagery, right? It's like a um, movie theater that is supposed to have, like a 3D movie theater, but really like 4D or 9D. Um, don't those exist where you feel things and you, and you smell things in the movie theater as part of the movie experience? Right. Last question now. What is the theme of the poem? So some of y'all have sent some really good answers here. Right? Um. Eliana, remind me, I'll come back to that question just now, right? Okay, so you're saying the beauty of nature, right? No, my, I also read about a theater somewhere in Val saying that was, that it wasn't 40, it was something else. It was, I'll find the article and show you. All right, but yes, uh, the, back to the question. The beauty of nature, um, nature in Jamaica, the, um, the cycle of nature, all of those things would work, right? Now, an answer like nature by itself would be a little too broad, right? Um, we want to be able to say what aspect of nature is being discussed in the poem, right? All right, so look back over your answers. I'm going to put the beauty of nature that was sort of um, of nature in Jamaica because it's not nature everywhere, right? This was the most popular answer. And for seven... We said he was proud, and the evidence is um, the positive attributes about Jamaica. All right, number nine is written on the screen, sound and smell. Right? All right, so look, not climate change in Jamaica, that implies something else, right? Um, look back at the questions and see if you have any you did not get answers to. I will pause here for two minutes so you could round out your answers. Ask if you have a question. Okay, let's continue. Right. You all have a, a saying to guess. And there are some clues on the 
screen. It's an expression. Each each line is a word. So what do you think these pictures are for? You know this expression? You have a farmer, you have some hay, and you have a sun shining down on them. And well, the barnyard, but that's the barn and the animals, but that's like a um as a red herring. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, great. One person has gotten it. All right, I'm going to put um, a word in here. Make. All right, another person has gotten it. So Aiden has it, Nathaniel has it. No, not do. Make hay while... The sun shines. Make hay while the sun shines. Right. Francis has it too. Good. Right. So have how many of us have never heard this expression? Yeah, it's a real old timey expression, right? Yeah. When I was in primary school, we used to have this book called The Student's Companion. And it would have a list of proverbs and you had to memorize them. You were expected to memorize them. I'm not really sure why, but that's probably why I know it. Um, anyway, what does it mean? Well, how do we make it? We start off with the grass. Let me get some green ink here. Here's the grass. Grass, 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 grass. Right, and along comes the farmer, and he cuts it down, right? And then it has to stay out and has to dry. And then it, they, it turns into hay somehow magically, right? And they tie it up in bales or they roll it up in rolls sometimes. And who is, what are they going to do with this hay? What's going to become of this hay? They will feed the animals in winter time, right? Right. In winter time when there's no grass growing for them to eat. But you can only make hay when the sun is shining. Grass won't dry unless the sun is shining, right? If it's snowing, if it's raining, you can't make hay. So we make hay while the sun shines so that when the sun is not shining or the season changes, we have hay. So what does it mean? Okay, Aiden has put a nice translation here. Don't waste time. Use it wisely. Right? Um, how else can we say this? We could say work while you can. Right? So it's like, for instance, like you need to work and save for retirement because you won't always be able to work, right? All right, now I want you all to remember the Proverbs, right? For the older students, you know, when you're doing multiple choice, sometimes you get these mixed metaphors questions and it's really that they lump together pieces of Proverbs. All right, let's continue then, right? Make hay while the sun shines. Okay, we have a few more like this throughout the presentation. Um, let's define some terms. Uh oh. All right, let me just make some space here. So we can write in the definition as we do it together, right? All right. Every poem has a persona or a speaker. What does that mean? Who is the persona? Who is the speaker? What is a persona? What is a speaker?
No, any poem we just looked at, right? Um, this poem here. That was written by H.D. Carberry. It's a poem about Jamaica. Is H.D. Carberry from Jamaica? The real answer is we don't know. But do we think that he's from Jamaica? Does he have to be from Jamaica? Could he be somebody who visited Jamaica and loved it so much? I, I mean, it could be she too. I don't know what the H and G stand for. That they wrote this poem about Jamaica. Is that possible? So the speaker in this poem is very cheerful, very patriotic. Oh, Jamaica is beautiful. It's so great, right? But maybe H.D. Carberry doesn't walk around every day feeling like that. But to write the poem, H.D. Carberry put on a persona or a he created a speaker for the poem, right? Um. So we must not always assume that the writer of the poem or the writer of the work is um the, the person speaking in the poem. All right, so we will define this as um, the voice of the poem. Now, if it were a story, you guys might say, somebody said this in the chat, a narrator, right? The character who speaks, yes, it could be the poet themselves, but it might not be the poet themselves, right? Um, so possibly the poet. Um, but also possibly a, a made up an abstract idea. Right? To convey the point. Okay. Now the next one is themes. I'll give you some time at the end um to Right, if I'm moving a little too fast, right? Um, the next one is themes. Tell me about what is a theme in a literary work. So just now, um, the poem we read, we said that the theme was nature in Jamaica. Yeah, okay, good. So the main idea, um, and it's usually sort of a a statement or a message about something that the writer wants to send, right? So the main idea, the central idea, um, a message, let me put a semicolon here instead of a colon, right? Um, a message about something, a message sounds like, slash life lesson that the writer wants to send. Okay, so examples of different themes. Okay, so just now we looked at nature, right? Um, this poem about Jamaica. So um, you don't have to take down the examples. Only if you are confused about what a theme is, you could write down the example, right? But nature in Jamaica is beautiful. Could be one theme, right? Um, in another poem or another piece of writing, a theme could be um, nature is threatened by mankind. Right. Another theme could be nature is resilient and strong. Right. So different works, different poems will have different themes, different stories will have different themes, different movies, different books will have different themes. Right. 
Now, if I just say nature, that is very vague and it doesn't help someone understand. Um, well, what aspect of nature? What about nature was shown there? All right, what about the next one? Figurative language. What word do you recognize in figurative? Do you recognize figure, like a person, more so than a number? Um, right, so this is when language, yes, like a, well, kind of like a figure of speech, but this is more like, no, 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 not like a figure of speech. Actually, um, let me write that here. Figure of speech is, is like a thing that we might have. Um, figurative language is when we use language creatively, right? So using language creatively. So it could be a figure of speech. It's not exactly a figure of speech, right? Um to go beyond the literal meanings of words. Right? So for example, the truth hit me like a ton of bricks. Right? Um, so, you know, it didn't literally fall on you like a ton of bricks because then we would be dead, right? Um, it's an expression, right? It's it, In this case, we could say a figure of speech, right? Because um, in the sense that like we wouldn't say a ton of feathers. We wouldn't say that. But in reality, a ton of feathers should weigh the same as a ton of bricks, right? So it should hurt us just as much because it's a ton, right? Um, but the expression is a ton of bricks, right? As well as all the other similes, all the other metaphors. What did we see just so many points? We saw personification. We saw onomatopoeia. Right, and all the other things we haven't talked about yet. We, we mentioned imagery, right? All of these things are also figurative language. We usually say figurative language in relation to poems. All right, let's move a little faster so we can take a break. Um, tone, how something is said, right? And mood, the feeling that one gets after one read something or listens to something or watches something oops all right so the feeling evoked we say by the word right the feeling that it makes the reader feel okay yeah the author's attitude towards what he is um, writing about Right, I'm just gonna add that here. The author's attitude, right? Um, how okay, so this is and this is basically how the reader feels. All right, any questions? Anybody wants to ask about this? So next week we're gonna spend time. If you have questions, put them in the chat, right? Next week we're gonna spend time going into the actual literary devices. So contrast on the map sphere, personification, and so on. That will probably take us, we will do it piece by piece. There are so many of them. It will probably take us the rest of the month to get through most of them, right? So all poems have figurative language and all poems have a theme. All poems have a speaker, a tone, and a mood, right? So when you are reading, it's a good idea to evaluate the poem for these things before you go to the questions. All right. 
So we have one bird, and then we have two birds in a bush, well, in the bushes. Which would you rather have? This one that is in front of you, or those two that are off in the bushes? The one that's alone, why is that? All right, so a bird, because it doesn't have company. All right, so we will be its friend. A bird in the hand is, anybody knows the rest of this expression? or you found it on Google because you're quick with the keyboard, right? Is worth good. All right, Nathaniel has it, yes. Two in the bush. A very weird saying, right? Okay, so suppose you are a bird catcher and you catch and sell birds for a living. Is it better to go after this fella here or these two? What's the danger if you go after the two? They will fly away and you won't get to them. But if you already have this one here, right? We keep this one. So what does this mean in normal English, in non-figurative language? What does it mean? What does it mean? So, okay, this is a valid question. How are you supposed to know the way I'm saying? Well, as soon as you get enough out of me, a keyword or two, just go to Google and let Google tell you, right? Um, right, guys, what does it mean? It means it's better to hold on to an opportunity that you have rather than to go chasing after two that you might get, right? So better, I'm going to write it out, but you don't need to write it if you will remember, right? So better to, better to hold on to an opportunity that you have instead of chasing possibilities. Because as soon as you approach the bush, what will happen? The birds might fly away instead of chasing. Okay, another way to say it, yes. Okay, so Dana's, Dana's way is it's better to be content with what you have than to risk losing everything seeking to get more. This seems like it would be a good story topic. Right, okay. All right. Um. Oh, Um. well, okay, imagine, imagine that you, um, you're already holding him, right? Because you already have it. This is you, you're a big catch up. Yes, like the dog and the bone. You know the story, the Aesop's fable of the dog and the bone? It's the same idea. He had a bone, he was crossing a bridge. He looked over into the water. He saw a, uh, another dog in the water with a bigger bone. So he let go of his bone to chase after the dog, but of course it was his reflection. So he got nothing, right? Same kind of idea. All right. Let's go to the next thing we're going to try to do. Let's practice some thesis sentences. All right. So quickly, let's remind ourselves what is a thesis sentence. It goes in an essay at the end of an introduction. So we wouldn't write this if we were writing a story. We wouldn't write this in creative writing. We wouldn't write this in a report necessarily. You write something like it, but not exactly this, right? So in an essay, it goes at the end of the intro. It gives your opinion on the topic. And it gives two to three reasons that you could then turn around and develop into paragraphs, right? All of that in one sentence. 
or two sentences, that would be fine, right? All right, so help the characters make their arguments. All young children should have a pet. Oh, I left out a picture for the second one. All right, that's all right. What do y'all think? All young children should have a pet? Okay, yes. Um, no, the yeses came in first and the noes came in after. Why or why not? Let me hear. So they could learn responsibility. Very good. We could turn that into a whole paragraph. What else? So Moika, very good point. All right, and no point is that they're dangerous. Okay, what else? A friend. Okay, a pet could be a friend. Good. Yes. Any other reasons for yes to pets or no to pets? Pets will end up in the sewers. How are they going to get to the sewers? It could give them allergies. A pet could keep you safe. Okay, I know is that they're costly for protection. All right, good. All right, so let's take these points. I think we have three on either side. And okay, now guys, remember, we are not, we don't care about, we're just making an argument, right? We don't have to get too invested in our side of the argument winning, right? All right, so one possibility is all children should have pets, right? They will lose 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, um, um, so first we will do the yes side because yes, people answered first and then we will do the no side. That's valid too, right? So one possibility is um, pet. Uh, now, the most boring way to say it is all children should have a pet, right? Pet, but I'm going to try and vary the language. So pets are must-haves for young Children, all right, let's see, must have isn't technically a word, and some of your teachers will give you grief for it. So let me change this to necessities. Right? All right, I'm going to put a colon here to be fancy, because when you put a colon, you're about to explain the thing you said before in a little more detail. And the reasons were... um. They teach responsibility. Right? They act as a friend. I think we might just have time to do the yes and the no for one, right? And what's one more reason we said? Oh, they protect you. They can protect their owners. Right now, you will notice that the three points I tried to introduce them in the same kind of grammatical way. So I said they teach, so they are a verb, right? Um, they act, they are a verb, and then they can protect, they are a verb, right? All right, and then some people said no. And what were the reasons? They will lose them. Okay. Um. All right, so children have no business having pets. This is the no side, right? Now I'm going to bring this up into smaller sentences because that is also possible for your thesis, right? All right, so pets are dangerous. So we would write a paragraph on that, right? Um. They cost too much. Now, should I ask, um, before you write this sentence, let me ask a question. Is it, do I say they cost too much and stop? Or do I say they cost too much um, in food and vet fees? Is that better or worse? And be advised, this is a trick question. And then the last piece would be, what's the third point? The, um, people will lose them. Oh, y'all think it sounds better? 
Hmm. All right. No, it does not. Um, and I'll show you why in a second, right? Um, but but it's important to note our instinct that we like how it sounds, right? But for our thesis sentence, um, we cannot have in that last phrase is too detail, it's too much detail. So you save that for when you get to the paragraph, and then you can talk about what the costs are. Is the girl Dora? No. Does Dora have like different hair? More like um and bigger eyes. Yeah, now she's Dora. All right. Um so I tricked you all, right? I want you to not have this in. This is too detailed. See, it was a trick. Sorry, sorry, right? Um, all right, so they cost too much. And then the last thing is um, pets are also dangerous. One time we went to Trin City Mall um, over the vacation, right? We just went there for something normal that you go to the mall for. Nothing strange. I can't remember what it was. But when we went, it turns out they had um some animals from visiting. Not exactly the zoo. Um, I can't remember exactly where it was from. But they were more like um animals from the swamp. So it was like hermit crabs and snakes and lizards and um one of the animals was a uh, came on on the floor and you could walk up and you could pet it. Would you all have gone up and pet it? Would you have let your little brother or sister go up and pet it? It was on a leash. It was on the floor. Just chilling. But it's still a wild animal, right? So suppose it decided that it was hungry. But it wanted a snack. Right when you were petting it. All right. Okay. So pets are also dangerous is what you all are saying. And yes, yes, I could see that. Yes. No, it didn't have anything around its mouth. The the uh, the owner or the trainer or whatever was just standing next to it with Alicia on its neck. But you would let your sibling do it. Hmm. Do you like your sibling? All right. Okay. Let me go back. Let's just recap what we did so far, and I would like you all to take down the two examples, right? So practicing thesis sentences, and you have the two examples. The other two we will do with another um day, right? Um, or I might ask you to do it for homework another day. All right. So the first example, pets are necessities for young children, and we're going to explain what the necessities, why they are necessities. We put a colon. They teach responsibility, comma. They act as a friend, and they can protect their owners. So we've given three reasons, right? The third thing. Not the third thing, sorry. The second example, this time um, we've broken it up into pieces because honestly, I know it can be hard to write one long grammatically correct sentence um, the first time we try it. So you have another option. You could break it up into smaller pieces, right? So the second one is broken up into smaller pieces. Children have no business having pets. That is our opinion. And then we give the reasons. Pets are dangerous. They cost too much. Oh, wait, I have the same reason twice. And nobody told me anything. You all listen to my Cayman story and you didn't tell me anything. Pets are also expensive. No way, that's cost too much. What's the third reason we don't want pets? Pets like to run away. They are messy. Okay, great. Um, Pets, okay, so pets are also too much work. And some of you mentioned um, that they could get lost easily, right? Of course, we want to phrase it like pets can get lost easily and not say pets will get lost in the dumbest of places, right? So um, that is also a possible third reason. They chew your shoes, right? They're very destructive. So you could say they're destructive. Pets are also destructive. All right. Any questions? Everybody is clear. Okay, so far we followed along. Anything confusing us?
All right. Anybody needs more time to write this down? Okay, one more minute. I am writing it down too. All right, ready to continue. Okay, I think we have one more proverb to guess. And let's see what that proverb is. Yes, now this one is a really hard one and very abstract. Um, yeah. Let's see if any of us can figure it out. Uh, so something is the something of something. And there's some odd punctuation here, but that should not be a full stop. And that I should be covered. So something is this something. All right. When you look at this picture, what would you call this bit sign? Mother. All right. Good. So that's the second word. Third one is brain or thinking. All right, let me just tell you the first one because I couldn't find a good um, image for it. necessity. Is the mother of what? If you don't know it, you could use Google to help you. Okay, ideas is the right concept. Ideas is the right, that's the right concept. But it's another I would. For the expression. So the the expression, right, invention. Good. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? Right. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Did y'all um, ever watch a TV show called MacGyver? So I'm going to put a note here. Next week, we need to watch some MacGyver clips. All right, so MacGyver was um, hard to explain. Um, so he was a fig an action figure, kind of. He would go around. I don't even know what his job was, but people would be in trouble and he would help them, right? Um, so one time, a fuse blew in some place that he was in. So... Um, you all know, like Wrigley's double mint gum, those the strips, how it's wrapped in this kind of silver paper. He took out, he chewed the gum, he took the paper and he wrapped it around something to replace the fuse. All right. So, okay. So here's Dana's more direct explanation here. When the need for something becomes essential, you're forced to find ways of achieving it. Yes. So we get creative, right? When we need something... Um, we invent, we get creative, right? We improvise. Good. All right, let's get the last thing that we're doing today. And this is a little grammar point now. Oh, and I didn't put in transitions. Let me put in transitions so we're a little less, we're not overwhelmed. So if you have the verb walk, 
the participle could be walking or it could be walked. Right? Yeah, it could be used as a noun because walking is a noun, right? Um, all right, so let's see. Let's get a different color other than pink. Right, a word form from a verb. Example, walking. Walked. Um, sitting. Standing. Um, uh, moved, moving. All right, good. So we we have the general examples, right? The ed forms of the verb and the ing forms of the verb. Right. So, go ahead. You could make a note of that. I'll pause to give you time for a minute, right? Well, first I've given you the rules, sorry. Um, so when there is a participle, or sometimes it's called a participle phrase, right? So you could consider just, just the participle if you want. So the ing or ed form, right? At the start of a sentence, it has to be at the start, right? The noun or the pronoun doing the action, must clearly connect it, right? Now, if you could think of a simpler way to say this, you could do so. If it is, if you want to stop at must clearly connect, that's okay, right? You can shorten the note, just make sure you understand it, right? All right, so let's look at an example of a wrong sentence. Walking on the beachfront, the stars shone brightly. Any error in the sentence? What's the error in the sentence? Who is doing the walking? Somebody. Does the sentence tell us who? The stars, right? But the stars not really doing the walking, right? Okay, so this is the noun. And this is who it seems like is doing the walk-in, right? But that can't be right. No. So how are we going to correct this? So the wrong version makes it sound like, it makes it sound like the stars are doing the walk-in, right? So instead we could say, while I was walking, blah, 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 I saw the stars shining brightly, right? Or we could say the stars shone brightly while I walked, blah, 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 on the beach front, right? Everybody sees the, the difference? Now, in other languages, when you have the verb alone with no subject, sometimes it's okay because from the verb, you could tell who's doing the action. Not so in English, right? You have to have the doer of the action. Now, there's also the option I can leave it as walking on the beach front. Right, I saw the stars shining brightly. Right, so I could leave, I don't have to remove the walking, I could leave the walking. But if I leave the walking, this thing that comes after the comma has to be the doer of the action. Right, now there are other names for this problem. Sometimes it is called a dangling modifier because it's not connected to what it's supposed to be connected to. So it's sort of just hanging in midair, it's dangling, right? Um, <clears throat> and it's a modifier because it's telling you about somebody. It's telling you what someone is doing, walking on the beach front. So a modifier is something that tells you about something else. Modify means to change. 
Well, the person was just a normal person. But then when we got this phrase, walking on the beach front, we understood, no, they are a person who walks on the beach, right? So that makes it a modifier. All right, anybody confused? Anybody have a question? Anybody still write it? Okay, um, well, we already wrote all the right visions. And here is one more example. Walking down the street, my keys fell out of my pockets. Explain to me the error in this case. What's the error here? The same problem, right? I don't have the doer of the action clearly linking to walking. As it's written, it sounds like the keys were walking on the street. So I need to change it to while I was walking on the street, my keys fell out of my pocket. Or my keys fell out of my pocket while I was walking on the street. Or walking on the street, I dropped my keys and I didn't realize. Right? And another example, eating in the living room, my juice fell on the carpet. So who was doing the eating in the living room? Was it the juice? No, right? All right, so between these two, you could choose one of them to write as a wrong example, and then you could write your own correct vision next to it, right? All right, so the last thing, I'm, I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that. And that will actually, let me just put these on the screen one time. All right, so this will be homework. Right? Yes, guys, you could take a screenshot, but hold on, let me give you the instructions for how you're submitting or what you're submitting, right? Right? So rewrite these correctly. Right? Now, how do you submit? You send a picture via WhatsApp. You could send it from your parents' phone. You could send it from your phone, right? 2796-7733. Right? Lower form students. Please make sure to complete it. Upper form students, um, I, I guess it's optional. Try at least a few now, right? It's a five-minute exercise if you just try a few. Um, when is it due? Okay, so reasonably speaking, if you want me to give you feedback before next class, by Sunday. By Sunday night. Before Monday morning, right? Um, this was not live on YouTube, so we'll put up the recording within 24 hours. So if you don't get a chance to screenshot it right now, and you don't have time to write down all right now, um, you can come back to the recording. You should have enough time, right? Make sure the picture is clear. Oh, and also please write your name with your name. Because if you don't send your name, I cannot give you credit for having done it, right? Max is at 6.45. Okay, questions, concerns? Everybody understands what they have to do for homework. If you have a question, you have to put it in your chat, right? Yes, so it is 6.10. Um, you can go ahead and write on your homework if that's what you're doing, right? Finishing notes if that's what you're doing. But once you are done and you have everything noted, you all are free to leave, right? Enjoy the rest of your evening. And I'll see you all. Some of you I will see Saturday. Some of you I will see next week.